All right, we are live. All right, so um, thanks for those that are joining on. Um, I am Fred Faulkner. We are going to do a little bit of a different experiment today. I am doing something live on the interwebs, um, and I'm going to be recording a podcast live, and I have a guest. So we're going to try something new, try something exciting. Um, I've been following a lot of other people doing this, and I'm going to take the, take the plunge. So um, without further ado, um, today I have with me is Sunita Reese. And Sunita Reese is the Chief Encouragement Officer at First by Five, which is her consulting company. Sunita brings 18 years of business and leadership experience, uh, including working with Fortune 500 to startups, um, managing international projects, building teams from 2 to 20, working on marketing departments, building marketing departments, all the things in between, including talking to C-suite leaders um, for both nonprofit and commercial sectors. And so today we're going to talk a little about growth and entrepreneurship. So if you wouldn't mind joining me, I'm going to bring into the studio, Miss Sunita Reese. Sunita, hello and welcome to the podcast. Hey, Fred, it's a pleasure to be here. It is a pleasure indeed. It's been a while. I know we had a quick chat um, a couple of weeks ago, maybe even longer, but you know, it was great catching up with you after a number of years of not, you know, really being in touch because we were working at the same company. We moved on to different different paths, but our paths have seemed to cross over again. And it's really exciting to talk to you and learn more about what you're doing with First by Five. Thank you. So I have to just say, you know, I had a little bit of my own little thing, um, you know, business a while ago prior to what I'm doing today. And, you know, I had like the chief big thinker was my name because you get to pick the thing once <laughs> your company, you get to pick your own, um, your own name. But um, yeah. tell me why chief encouragement officer was the one that you chose. Sure. So, you know, part of my journey into entrepreneurship has honestly been um, embracing being who I am and encouragement is one of my natural gifts. So in business, we need to make money. We need to pay taxes. We need to do all the things. But fundamentally, we're solving problems and we're working with people. At the end of the day, um, I'll quote somebody who said, business is fundamentally about people and numbers. And the people component is really what I'm jazzed about. And so I decided to embrace that gift and stick it on there because I do a lot of uh, just you know good old-fashioned business stuff, but I do want to bring an encouraging attitude to the mix. And it's not only for junior people. You know, Sometimes the people who need encouragement the most are the people who have been at it the longest. Uh, you know, 20 years experience working in different worlds. I certainly understand the need for encouragement. I certainly understand the need for, for just that motivation. It's not something that goes away no matter how long you're in the world. And for anything, COVID has just continued to bring, you know, a lot of stress in our lives and encouragement yes. is probably something that, you know, we need to be, we need to be doing um, more and more just to kind of keep getting through the grind uh, for sure. Yeah. So um, as I mentioned live, so this is the person I was telling. So um, so Carrie O'Shea Girl Gone, she helps co-host a number of shows, including a couple of oh. podcasts. So Carrie, as we call her Carrie in the comments, is here live. So Carrie. Hello, thanks. Carrie. Um, so first by five. So you've worked at a number of companies. You've worked at, you know, one yes. we've worked at before. Um, you've moved on to a couple different things. Uh, so tell me about first by five and where did that kind of start? Why first by five is kind of your path now and your your focus? Yeah, so my journey into entrepreneurship, I think, is a story of avoiding burnout and also finding freedom. So I've done the corporate thing, and I was, like many people I know, getting burnt out on it, um, and really, at the end of the day, wasn't feeling fulfilled. So I jumped ship and decided to be a stay-at-home mom for my two boys, who are now 10 and 7. But it, even though that was great, I knew I wanted to get back and do additional stuff. Um, being a full-time mom is a hard job. So anybody listening out there um, who thinks, you know, well, you don't get it, it is one of the most challenging and rewarding things ever. But I also know that I've got, um, I'm supposed to be helping people out in business. So after looking around and really not finding anything that I really resonated with in terms of uh, a role that I could get hired back into, I thought, all right, well, I want, I want the freedom to be able to be flexible and uh, go. If my family wants to go spend a month somewhere, let's go. So I settled on uh, doing something online and um, 
basically jumped into the world of online marketing support because it was really the only concrete thing I could grab onto uh, that seemed to work and where I knew there was a market. But fast forward, and as I mentioned earlier, part of this journey has been about uh, just being more of myself. And I've realized I can bring my experience, I can bring what I've learned about, you know, just really uh, doing business in the online space together with my passion for um, leadership and building teams and pull it all together to help entrepreneurs as they are building their teams and they're seeking to solve problems and do great things. So um, that's the story in kind of a large nutshell, but let me just add because the name sometimes people are like, I, I don't get it. Why don't you just call yourself Sunita <laughs> Consulting? <laughs> and in retrospect, maybe that would have been better, but A, um, I've never been a big fan of putting my name on things. Yep. Just, it is what it is. And the, the name for me is really about uh, priority and possibility. So first is keeping things first things first. That's both a life perspective, but then a business perspective. And five, yes, I'm an early riser. So I, lo I love 5 a.m., but um, it's also a number that, that connotes grace. So we're out there in the world to do great things and there's competition in it. But um, I really hope that we can all carry some grace with it. So That's awesome. That's awesome. And I know when I started my company, I called it AIE Digital. It was anchored in excellence. Yeah. I didn't want to have my name in it. I went through 50 different types of thoughts of what my name could be for yeah. my company, um, you know, as short lived as it was. So I certainly understand, you know, the idea of doing something different. And it's it's a branding thing. It's something you want to kind of like give yourself a little bit more sure. of something that isn't, isn't, you know, maybe you specifically. So I, cert I certainly understand that. But I love the fact that you're focusing on entrepreneurs, right? I mean, when we do individual consulting, you see a lot of people will put like these big brands on their website. I've worked with so-and-so and I've worked with so-and-so and they've been small engagements or big engagements, but you know, entrepreneurs, you know, that is the lifeblood of America. I mean, and most businesses are small businesses. Most businesses are not these big behemoth fortune 500 companies. So the fact that you've chosen entrepreneurs as, as that focus, that startup kind of world. So tell me why, like that segment specifically, is there something about entrepreneurs that, yes. that, that called to you because, you know, we've worked in, you know, bigger public mm -hmm. for-profit companies. And so why that niche? So this has been part of the journey. And I think I've really only settled on it within about the last two years, right? So my, my company's uh, just nearing three years. And in about the last two years, I got clear on this because, um, there's a lot more movement in life there for me to work to work with. But as you mentioned, not only are, are entrepreneurs the lifeblood of our economy, but it takes um, <laughs> it takes a lot of guts to go do this. And most entrepreneurs go into business for themselves because they want freedom, kind of a light lifestyle freedom. Um, and then a lot of them are ambitious too. But in there, there's there's sort of an epic story for everybody. And so I like being able to enter into that personal story as well as the business story. One, two, I love that entrepreneurs fundamentally are um, problem solvers. They're, they're there because they're trying to create or problem solve, usually not just do something to make a buck. And so that um, just calls to me at a deeper level. That's great. So, um, Life has, you know, two years in your business and the, the, you know, this last year, three years in your business, this last year has been way different. Now, yeah. you know, it's not like you were going in office maybe, but, you know, we're certainly not in front of clients anymore. We're certainly not doing maybe the normal things. How has COVID in the last eight mm -hmm. months, you know, maybe not so much affected, you know, your business, I'm sure it has, but maybe more, how's it affected your clients? Like, how are they adapting to this new space? I mean, not everyone is a work from home all the time environment, you know, so yeah. what is, what is it, what have you seen? What trends are you seeing is what, what's going on in startup land, entrepreneur land when it comes to this? Yeah, that's such a great question because um, I primarily work online, but my clients have been arranged. Like I had a very successful pediatric dentist as a client. I work with somebody in the um, construction space and then I work with some other more, you know, kind of from businesses that are more suited to online. So some of the trends I'm seeing is that whether you, we, we all knew that we were all digital to a degree before, right? Even if all you had was a website and email, you could no longer just not be digital. But I think one of the things people have um, either reluctantly had to embrace is we're all virtual too. And that's a little bit different. So it's been really interesting, particularly for um, 
clients that I work with who do a lot of in-person events where it's not a nice to have, but it's a really important part of doing business, try to adjust to that. Um, I'm sure you have seen this with your own work, just kind of the plethora of virtual events that have popped up, some much more successful than others. So A, I would say adapting to kind of the uh, virtual engagement, especially in an organized way, but then B, just really needing to manage your energy and connectedness. Um, I'm not throwing that out there to sound too kind of off the wall, but it's a real thing. Uh, a friend, a business friend of mine, you know, uh, did a little interesting poll on LinkedIn the other day and just was asking, how many Zoom calls are, are too much for you in a day? <laughs> the answer that came back, no matter how long was, it, it, on average, it was between three and four. And so I think another trend that we're seeing is just people needing to um, really adapt how they are getting their work done while also not fighting this kind of daily tendency to maybe burn out on technology, right? And then last but not least, I'm wondering if you can relate to this, Fred, is just... Um, Boundaries, boundaries and ritual, keeping things going when our work and our and our living space are one of the same, um, especially if you're in places where maybe you're living in apartments that are 400 square feet. Like, that's crazy. I have colleagues that are definitely fighting the, the space issue. I'm fortunate mm -hmm. enough that I have a dedicated space. It, it, yeah. it was, you know. I had to install French doors to make it dedicated, but yeah. you know, um, but it was still it's still dedicated. And I do fight some of that where how many, you know, how much after, you know, a certain time do I just not come back into this space? You know, this, you know, whatever yeah. you know, size space, like, do I not come back in? Because when I sit down in this chair, what is it that I'm going to be focused on? Is this, you know, balance between, you know, what's the next podcast can be, or is it the two screens in front of me and I'm not going to be doing work again? And yeah. Um, it, it is a, you know, there's definitely challenges with that. And believe me, call it Zoom fatigue, Teams fatigue, you know. Whatever, I have, yes. I have five different video conferencing platforms on my computer that we use for a variety of whether, you know, whoever I'm yes. talking to. Um, even that's a challenge. It's like, which one are we using today? What, what is this meeting going to be on? So there's a, a member of one of my client teams where she and I have just, we Zoom, but like occasionally she's just, can I just call you? And it's such a relief to just have a conversation on the mobile phone Yep. and we get yep. busy, we get work done, you know, and it's uh, interesting how that's kind of evolved. We used to but, do yeah. a lot of walking meetings where we take our calls and we do it through style into the conference. Yes. Call. And then we would, everyone's like, hey, we're just all go walk around your neighborhood, whatever it's going to be. But now that it's getting cold outside, I will definitely see how winter changes some of our behaviors, even if we wanted to stay more indoors, but still then get, you know, well, I'll call it claustrophobic, but it's not even that, but it probably true. is in some, in some ways as well. If I could just tack on one thing, I, I just think that um, it's it's a good reminder just to you know try to have that extra empathy for people's individual physical spaces because I don't live in a mansion, but like I can go outside, right. I can walk around the block. Um, my my office, which used to be a guest room first, home office second, and is now a home office first, guest room second. Right, I I have a space that I go to. I toggle with my husband, so we have to kind of. Uh, Yep. We have to share space and manage the schedules. But it's just reminding me of um, when I was shortly out of grad school, I did a really cool project with the World Bank uh, and had to work with a bunch of people in different parts of Africa and Hong Kong. And I lived in a junior one bedroom. Are you familiar with that term? No, I'm not. <laughs> It's essentially an efficiency that has an alcove. So it got called a junior one bedroom. But um in that process, I had a roommate who was awesome, but I had to go into our very large walk-in closet to do my calls when she was sleeping, right? Because I'm working with Asia and with Africa and we're living outside in, in DC. So I was just reflecting on that the other day and thinking, you know, there are people that I work with or may work with that might be in that same situation. And that added stress of like having to go into your closet and take a call. I just trying to be a little empathetic. Yep, people. absolutely. So a question from the crowd. So Carrie asks, you know, how did your growing up between Southeast Asia and the USA affect your philosophy about life and in business? And I think this is the scene you're just talking about Asia in the last comment. Yeah. We'll, we'll jump right into that question and see what you see what you got to say. Yeah, it's such a good question. I think, um, you know, 
Asians in general tend to have a little bit more of a relational approach to doing business, especially when I was growing up, right? I know the world has gotten smaller and people have adapted different ways of doing things. But I think one that has always really stuck with me, um, going back and visiting my family there, just seeing relationships that my mom has had that when she hasn't seen somebody in years and years and years, but they pick up and with her and may go and they're you get her a deal on a carpet or something like that. I'm just throwing that out there as an example, but just this relational approach um, to life. I think that's one way it's been really strong. The other thing is just learning and being adaptable. I mean, just to keep things um, very, very transparent. You know, my father is, uh, he grew up on a farm in Illinois and found his way to Asia in the Peace Corps. My mom was the daughter of a police officer from Malaysia, but by no means came from from very, a very privileged background. So just having sort of that, the world is, is big and we can learn even if we're not, we don't get it right. I think that is sort of uh, one thing that carries through um, for life and business in me. It's, it's learning and taking people as they come and not getting it right and always and seeking to do better. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the topics that we talked about um, on our previous, you know, just get together, just kind of catch up call was growth. And, and that is a big word. It's a packed word. Um, you know, when we think of growth, growth usually means in many companies, especially when you're in startups or even in big, big organizations, growth is usually, I'll call it a, a replacement word, the new sexy replacement word for revenue. So yes. if you're going to be like a chief growth officer, you're yes. really, you know, everyone thinks about revenue. <laughs> well, yes, growth is all about revenue. Growth has a lot of levers you can pull um, mm -hmm. to get what growth, what growth means. So, you know, where do you see growth? You know, you mentioned, on, you know, what you do with your business. Like, how are you helping startups understand growth? And where are some of the areas that you're helping them understand that lever pulling instead of just always the bottom line of revenue? Because growth does come in a lot of different ways. Yes. Um, you know, I would say in terms of, of purpose, how you're doing business, right? Not just what you're selling and who your customers are, how you're doing business, and then also the unsexy back end of things to keep it running. So I'll start with uh, purpose and vision. I and mean, those are such buzzwords. And, you know, right now people, oh gosh, yeah, of course, yeah, growth and vision. <laughs> but here's the thing, vision is fundamentally, where are we going, right? Where are we going? And when people know where, where they're going, there's uh, an added excitement and I think um, a tapping into how they go about their work every day. Uh, somebody, a podcast I listened to recently described it as this, Purpose and vision unleash energy in an organization. So a lot of times people aren't don't can't stop down, especially, I'm sorry, can't slow down enough to put that on paper and get clear for themselves, right? Especially entrepreneurs, they want to get there as quickly as possible. But taking the time to do that provides a powerful tool for you to not only unleash that energy in your organization, but it has a multiplier effect. It helps you kind of attract people. It helps you um, make decisions and all that goodness. So that's that's one area. The second thing is how, how are we going to show up and, and do this work? I think when people know not only when people have bought into a company and want to be there um, and also know what parameters they can operate within, it further unleashes energy and power within an organization beyond just getting that revenue. Like if you let Tim Ferriss, um, you're probably familiar with him, mm -hmm. author of the yeah, four day work week. He describes how at some point, I think it was his vitamin business uh, that he started. They were having these recurring customer service issues and it was making him work more than four hours a week. And so what he ended up doing was empowering the people who was, were closest to the problem to solve any customer issue they had within a hundred dollars. If it was over a hundred dollars, they would come to him. And what that did was, you know, it let the people closest to the problem take care of the issue, but made more sales, but I'm get, those people were happier too. So I guess when, as I work with clients, um, I'm trying to really bring that out. Like, how are we going about doing business? It's not always about doing the task. We're building a capability. We're building ownership. Um, and then that last bit is the ops piece, which I love. Um, I'm not a tech head in the sense that I love to tinker on the back end of stuff. I'm adept and appreciative of technology, but not necessarily an enthusiast. But process and tech, you know, because you're a big customer experience advocate. 
man, if you can be intentional about that, and even if it's incremental and takes a long time, you can set yourself up on a springboard that can really empower growth by building customer advocates, by just so many things. So I think those three things, kind of that vision, team, and then the ops piece. And, and the things that you just talked about are kind of where we're seeing, or I see more of what's going on in customer experience, right? Customer experience is great, but only when your employees are just as in tune with what the customer experience is supposed to be. So your point about Tim Ferriss saying customer service can, within a hundred bucks, can, can fix the problem, right? They can, they can remedy this. They can make customers more engaged and more um, participatory with their brand mm-hmm. and enabling trusting your your teams and enabling them to do the right thing you know and if not then there's a, an escalation level you can go to but good employee experience also leads to great customer experience yeah, excellent point. point written by a lot of companies Forrester writes about it Gartner writes about it. I mean everyone's kind of talking about that space but you know to your point about um the employee part I think it's really it's really fascinating because um, culture eats strategy for breakfast, right? Yes. So, um, yes. And employee culture is so huge in today's day and age. And now, especially with this whole work from home thing, like I would remember, I have to remember, you know, going, being in the office and having those sidebar conversations in the lunchroom or, or you know, being just like, hey, you want to go grab lunch? And then let's, you know, that culture um, it is so powerful. And, and now in this work from home where companies are adjusting to having such in-person worlds, now they got Zoom fatigue, they have these video conference fatigue, because I think we're striving, we're grasping at straws for some semblance of what our culture used to be, that we now have to recreate a new culture to adapt to this remote world that we live in. That's a hard thing to do. Um, I don't care what size company you are. If you're you know, a, a Fortune 5 or a Fortune 5 million, like it's, it's that, unless you're purposely set up that way from day one, and you have a culture that works. So like automatic is one I think about. Basecamp um, is another one I think about. That Mailer about. Light is set up that way, 100% remote. Yeah. So so are some are your clients facing some of those challenges? Like how are they navigating this, this new world where now they had this great culture of a startup? Is it translating into remote land or is it, are they all, is everyone struggling that we're assuming? It's- well, you know, some of my clients um, are primarily remote. They were like that. So I think what's changed for them is just how much more life comes into the remote aspect, right? Because people having children working uh, or doing homebound learning and all that stuff. That's not quite what you asked, but for those remote first companies, I think they're still challenged a little bit as well because you don't have as much flexibility to just do whatever you were doing before. Right. Um, but for those companies that were not set up, uh, you know, remote, yeah, it, it's definitely it's definitely hard. It's hard to just do impromptu stuff. And I think a few of the things I've seen, um, and and just to set just to be be candid, you know, it's not like I'm working intimately with hundreds of companies, but I have an extended network now working online for so many years, and so I get to hear the stories from my friends and my colleagues. And uh, yeah, keeping teams connected, I think, for people who want to be uh, good leaders. It, this situation is almost harder for them because um, I personally know a couple really great leaders who are experiencing burnout because they're working so hard to keep the team connected while doing everything else that it's taking a toll on them. So one of the things that I would say is, you know, leaders need to be designing these cultures and keeping track of their, their folks and how they're doing, but leaders need to take care of themselves because if leaders cannot take care of themselves during this time, they're not going to be able to um, set up that environment and and learn how to adapt with the culture and do that for you know for their teams. So exactly, I and mean, we're all we're all struggling. That is for sure. So um, besides taking care of yourself, and we hear this all the time, but is there any other kind of advice you're giving entrepreneurs and startups like, that are? navigating you know growth or just they're they're as you know yeah. you see a bunch of companies that are actually starting businesses also in this land and it's oh, not yeah. like, those opportunities are still there 
So what are some of the, the other things you're seeing out in the market right now? With, so, uh, with so this is, you may be able to relate to this having come from agile environments, but one of the uh, trends I'm seeing is it's, it's not the use of Slack that's always been there, but kind of translating the idea of a daily or a weekly stand up onto Slack where you're not necessarily doing it real time, but you have a standard set of questions like, you know, what was a win you had today? Um, are you experiencing any roadblocks or things that are challenging you from making progress? What are you going to focus on next? And having that be a daily thing where team members drop it either in Slack or if there's a spot for it elsewhere. But the idea of moving this daily, we're going to connect. So to keep the flow of work happening like that outside of projects we may be working on together outside of something else, I'm seeing an uptick in that. Um, and I, I really like that because it provides a cadence, it provides a routine that people can just kind of log on to and, and the leader can see it. Or, and yeah. more importantly, teams and can see it as well and jump in to help one another out or, you know what I mean? I, so that's one thing that I'm saying. I think, you know, having this um, common base of understanding that no one's okay. Right. I think everyone's got some flavor of look, there's stress and anxiety going all over the place in this. This is not normal. We've heard this is not, there is no new normal. What is the new normal? The new normal is there is no normal, right? That is probably yeah. the best thing for the new normal. So, you know, having, having a little bit of, um, uh, maybe not the right word is humility, but having the right ability to be, I'm going to share that. I did not get as much done today because life got in my way. Um, you know, and how do that, you know, can team members help and pick that up? And and that I think goes a long way, whether you want to tell them on a video or whether it's something that's described in a, in a daily chat that you, you can jump into and, and then celebrate the wins too. It's like, yep, I got this done despite a bunch of other stuff and celebrating those, those wins as well as a team, I think is huge when it comes in. I don't care whether you're a startup or you're, you know, a, a agile team or, or whatever, like celebration and an acknowledgement of, you know, I need help are two huge things that I think we should all go in with a no judgment zone first for the, for the stuff I need help with. And then how do we then cheerlead everyone to make sure that we're continuing to have that motivation moving forward? Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, um, especially that point about celebration, because we can fall so much into this trap of we need to be productive that we forget for what. And that's, you know, one thing I'm personally very convicted of and trying to build into a habit. Why am I doing this, right? Is it really important? Okay, we're realizing we're having trouble doing, can we adjust? Does it have to be this way? Um, and then celebrating that progress, even if it's small, because um, Brendan Bouchard, whose name you may or may not know, he, he talks about doing this on a daily basis because you end up building momentum and a success habit. And especially if you can do that on a team or across a company, that's pretty powerful. I uh, was talking to a business owner today and she's celebrating her first year of being an independent business owner. She'd been doing her thing for a long time and then, you know, went out and she said, you know what? I didn't even realize I, I wasn't going to celebrate it. And I said, you absolutely should. That's an incredible milestone. Yeah. You should. Absolutely. And she said, maybe I should celebrate it every year. I said, you absolutely should. Awesome. All right. Yeah. So I'm going to do um, something I've never done on, on a podcast before with one of my guests, but I, I'm going to try some new type of segment things. And so today I'm going to, uh, we're going to do a lightning round. I gave you a little bit of a heads up. We're going to do a lightning round, but I didn't tell you what lightning round was going to be about. So um, they're pretty simple. I'm, I'm, I'm easing this in. I'm not going to do, you know, throw anything super out of there, but um, you have to choose one or the other. It's a, it's a quick this or that type of lightning round. So are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Coffee or tea? Coffee. First thing in the morning, right? Uh, wine or cocktail? Wine. Wine. Okay. Beach or mountains? Mountains. Okay. I'm learning more about Sunita that I didn't know before. Okay. Book or podcast? Book. Excellent. Well, there it is. A very easy lightning round. Didn't really have a ton for you today, but that was uh, one to kind of you know, learn more. So, all right. So why mountains? Uh, so hilarious um uh, my husband and i talk about this at depth because he's beach unequivocally i love beach but there is something about the mountains that I, I think calls forth greatness and at least inspires me in a different way than seeing um seeing the ocean which also really inspires me um but mountains are i feel small in a way that's good 
And it's, it's just, I also like the crispness of the air. I could wax poetic about mountains forever, but I won't, I won't bore your listeners with that. All right. So All right. Book, you mentioned book versus podcast, but yes. uh, what are you reading now and why are you reading it? Okay. I'm reading the one thing I'm reading two things. Uh, ironically, given that the title of the first book is called the one thing by Gary Keller of Keller Williams realty. And it's about finding and focusing on that one thing, uh, in business, which, um, I, I can learn from, and also is just a constant challenge, right. For any of us in business, slowing down, focusing and really honing in. So I'm that, and then, uh, what is it? Culture eats strategy for lunch. You mentioned that great quote, um, that quip that's yep. from Peter Drucker earlier in the podcast. There's an entire book inspired by that that is excellent about building cultures, and it's got kind of a cliff notes in the front. So anybody looking for kind of a quick, you know, read on culture during this time, that's a good one. Excellent. Well, I. I do read. Um, I have a number of books I want to read. Um, right now, though, I'm into the audiobooks. That's kind of my jam at the moment. Um, while I don't commute as much anymore, audiobooks is definitely uh, where I'm at. So the one that I will give you uh, as my recommendation, and I definitely recommend you do this in audiobook because the narrator is also the author, and that is Green Lights by Matthew McConaughey. Just came Ooh. out. So if you like Matthew yes. McConaughey, or as my wife refers to him as Matthew McConaughey. Um, so, um, <laughs> okay. But, you know, Southern, you know, Matthew McConaughey's Southern Texas draw. Um, he just wrote his book, came out. Um, it's kind of a memoir, but it's not really like a self-help thing. But I, you know, it, it's lots of stories, um, lots of great in insights. You learn about how he got on the set of um, Days and Confused, how he only had three three lines that whole movie and turned into, you know, uh, how he transformed that into a whole new you know piece, you know, the back ends of how he started his That's career. Cool. I'm not through it all yet, but um, I, I definitely give a good 30 minutes of listening to Matthew's voice in my head every now and then. Um, you know, That's awesome. Me, it's good. So, so when you're done with those, uh, yes. pick up the audio book of Green Lights by Matthew McConaughey. Green Lights, done. He just got a appointed. He just got put on the uh, faculty of his alma mater. Too. He is, and he talks. Yeah. Uh, he, he talked about that actually in so. Also, when I found out about green lights, he did um, hot ones. Have you seen that video uh, YouTube um, series? So I have not. Uh -uh. Also, highly recommend. Um, so, hot ones by First We Feast is a YouTube series. Um, Ten interview questions uh, over hot wings, and they the the sauce gets hot, uh, increasingly hot as you go through. So they usually bring on you know celebrities and and others that you know will talk about something. Usually have something to promote. And Matthew was re re promoting his new book, but um, he talks about um, he talks about how the interviewee, um, interviewer, you know, talked about how he got on, you know, the, the board and, and how bringing the different cultures of even that whole world into, um, how does the football stadium increase, you know, the culture of the, the university. And he talks about that, you know, whole world as well. So it's, he's a very fascinating guy. Nonetheless. Um, I would also go check that out cause it's actually, it's fun to watch him eat hot wings and talk cool. about stories. So, um, highly recommend that as well. Green so, lights and hot wings, check. Green lights, and then first we feast hot ones. Yes, definitely. Yeah, you know, check that out. So, well, Sunita, it has been great to have you on the podcast today. Um, for those that don't know how to get a hold of you, um, you know, if you're not on the the web version, um, you can find Sunita at firstby5.com. She has a great uh, guide there. You can also download. Um, it's called the top seven free task management tools ideal for teams. You can go grab that as well. But um, Sunita, is there any other way you can have people reach out to you? Yeah, certainly. Uh, feel free to email me, Sunita at firstby5.com. And you can always find me at LinkedIn and on Facebook as well. Awesome. Well, thank you again for joining. I look forward to catching up with you yet again at some other time. But thanks for being on the podcast today. Fred, thanks for the opportunity. It was a fun way to spend a Friday afternoon. I agree. I agree. We'll do it again soon. All right. Take care. Thank you. All right. So that was Sunita. Uh, and thank you again for joining this experiment of the According to Fred, the podcast done live on video this time around. Um, I'll have this published, you know, hopefully soon as I get up with some more interviews. If you are you know, looking to do a podcast, um, you know, check out Buzzsprout. Uh, they're uh, the people that I use to publish my podcast. That's a buzz, buzzsprout.com. Great tools and resources for you to actually go check out your podcast as well. Not sponsored, but still a great place to go check out resources. Thanks again to Sunita for joining. We'll catch you guys on the next one. Thanks again.